Okay, sports fans, here we go. Sports fans. That's right. Sports fans. Woo. Going bowling. Oh, we're bowling? Let's do this. As in UTSA football team is going oh, to a bowl. Yeah, right. Okay. Not. <laughs> okay, wait, I don't understand what that means. They're going, they're going, going to a bowl game. Bowl. Yeah, because if you win six games. What's a bowl game? Like the Rose Bowl, the. I don't Sunday know, bowl. sorry. I only know NFL stuff. I don't really do so. I don't know anything about the sports. Yeah. Okay, I'm handing back to be fine. The last few games I saw. Were that goes to her. And that one goes to you. And that one goes to you. And Caitlin's not here today. Oops, you get two. Wow. Okay, next item of business is some handouts. Okay, more paper. Yay! <laughs> Someday I'm going to have like a little folder that's all my vocal tech stuff, and I'll be able to go back to it. There you I do. I have three ginormous notebooks like that thick. <laughs> I once had a grad student. You guys are going to like, this is going to blow your mind. In one semester, 78 lesson observations. Because it was part of a project she was, it was a grad project she was doing. 78 lesson observations. I struggled with She was doing them here at UT Austin, at the high school where she taught, at, at Texas State. Yeah, 78 different. What was her, what was her project on? Um, it was comparing, and she interviewed the teachers that she observed, and it was looking at, um, she asked them questions about their teaching, and basically it was, do they practice what they preach, was the idea. You know, <laughs> these are the things they say, you know, are important or whatever, and then watching them teach. Did she get to hear them sing? Uh, no, I mean, it was, it was practice what they preach in their teaching, is what it was about. Oh. Anyway, um, okay, this next one, is stuff from the National Center for Voice and Speech, where I used to work years ago. And this is practically every medication commonly used. So, you know, if you are, um, if you are on, um, oh gosh, let's, um, if you are on lisinopril, it talks about what the effect on your voice might be. Or if you are on... Ritalin. Ritalin? Yeah, yeah Ritalin, Ritalin, is, on there. Ritalin is in here. It's yeah, because I, I was on Ritalin and my ENT was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so... It's very, it's a... Better. So what you've got, and I'll, I'll just hand it out and then you can look at it while I jabber. Sorry, I want to so much when I'm exaggerating. Okay, yeah, so the first so page so we could this is... That's a... ADHD. The first page is a guideline for the little shorthand stuff that occurs later in the thing. I'm so excited for this. Thank you. Yeah, that's really I've, I've needed this. Okay, so, so there's all the little codes there, you know, for what the... And then if you flip the page, you know, you can then find, like, the first bunch is antibiotics. And then notice right below that are herbal things that have an antibiotic effect. And on and on, you'll find um, different medications. And then, you know, if there are herbal things that do the same, you also can see those below, okay? Wait, where is that that it says that you have that? Oh, I see it, I see it. Yeah, okay. So for instance, um, you know, if you are on um, cephalexin as an antibiotic, um, O is the symbol there, and you have the, the risk of uh, candida, which is a fungal infection. Okay, I know. Yeah, thrush, thrush, which is a fungal infection. Yeah, you do not want to get a fungal infection in your respiratory tract. That's not that's not good. You don't want to have one. Did you have mushrooms there, Robert? Mm, no. No. <laughs> no. My 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 uncle had had a fungal infection and it nearly killed him. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, he had he had 
stuff all over his body. It was nasty. Okay, so you've got all sorts of different medications there. And you know, you can look either by the generic name. If you if you don't find it, you know, look by the generic names. Um, for instance, I mean a medication that I take for sleep, trazodone, is actually it was initially made as an antidepressant. Well, they found it absolutely stank as an antidepressant, but it worked really well to get you drowsy to go to sleep. And I take it an hour before I go to sleep and have a little snack and, uh, you know, like my eyes are starting to get dry and I'm yawning. It's like, well, okay, get in bed. Um, all right, so you've got all of those uh, different kind of medications. Yes, they do have um, hormonal contraceptives, they have all sorts of things here, all right? So this is, and the, the last, you know, little bit of it is a lot of herbal things, other frequently prescribed medications, herbal things, okay? So um, that should be helpful for you. And later in your teaching, you know, when students tell you, you know, well, my doctor put me on this, is this gonna, you know, have any effect on my voice? And first of all, the, the first thing you need to say is, when a doctor puts you on something, they're supposed to ask, okay, I sing, is this gonna have any effect on my voice? Good question to ask. This next grab bag of stuff. Do you feel that a lot of doctors know that, though? Because I feel like I ask that, and then I have to Google it, because there's a website that has Oh yeah, there are, there are websites that have it, drug interactions and, like, and things. Oh my gosh, I should not be taking well, this. Well, there's two things to say about that. Number one, um, if a medication is in a particular class of drugs, it will have all these side effects that that specific drug may not have. Okay. But if it's in a particular class of drugs, um, like the trazodone um, that I'm on, you know, and I read all the contraindications and stuff, and I'm like, really? He's like, it won't have those side effects. Oh. You know, seriously, it won't have those side effects. You know, one in 10,000 people might have this, and, and they have a lot of other health problems that you don't have. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, it's important to open those kind of dialogue starting questions with your doctors, though, all the time, and just say, you know, Dry, things that might dry me out, you know, or things that might have an effect upon, you know, a person's voice that otherwise they might not notice any other side effects, but if it affects my voice, that's a huge deal, because that's what I do. Um, and bless you, and we're more sensitive to voice changes than the average bear, yeah. I have a question about, uh, like, the hormones that they give to, like, sexually transitioning people. Mm -hmm. Because that's not one here. Um, there are lots of there are lots of ongoing studies about that, and, and those are um, very powerful um, medications. That particularly women transitioning to wanting to be male, that's an irreversible change to your voice. Um, even if you got off of them, there's been an irreversible change to your voice. Yeah. yeah. And what about that masculinizing effect on your voice is, as far as I understand it, not reversible at all. And what about birth control? They all say no effect, but I feel like there's a lot of... Well, the dosages on birth control pills are much, 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 much lower than they were back, okay. say, when our parents, your parents, my parents, um, you know, were first taking them. Much, much lower. Um, some people will have some effects from them, no doubt. Yeah. You know, again, hormones are powerful things, and, and your larynx, um, there have been some studies done by a guy named Jean Abipol. He's probably the... He's probably the world authority on uh, hormones, particularly um, with women and, and the voice. Mm -hmm. They were doing a study where they were basically swiping um, cervical mucus and looking at the vocal fold mucosa throughout 
women's menstrual cycles, and you have very specific, I mean, the epithelial cells in both sites respond in a very similar manner as you go through your hormone cycle. Um, so there's very obviously um, a lot of uh, sensitive sex receptor, sexual hormone receptors in your larynx, uh, in the tissue of your larynx. Um, so some people are gonna have more side effects than others. Yeah. Um, those are things always to consider in talking to your doctor about a medication like that. Um, there have been a number of studies. You can certainly um, look a number of them up. Um, I know this lady, Philippa La. She's uh, Portuguese. And um, she's done some studies. Of course, Avi Ball has done a number of studies. Um, it's a fairly hot topic. Um, there's a guy in Israel, uh, gosh, can't remember his name. Yeah, because I talked to Dr. Simpson about it, and he mm -hmm. said it's not, he said it shouldn't have an effect because it's such a lower, but then you have people who are on it for like 10 years, Well, so yeah. that low effect. Well, I think we've been doing a, a very uncontrolled experiment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, seriously, uh, on on our bodies on a lot of different levels. Okay. You know, people who take antidepressants for years and years and years, people who take contraceptives for years and years right. and years. Um, the long, long, long term results of some of the use of these medications we're just now starting to see where you have a whole generation of people who took, you know, women who took oral contraceptives for yeah. 10, 15, 20 years, you know, and then, well, what happens to them 10 and 15 and 20 years down the line? We're still just gathering a lot of that data. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, those are retrospective studies where they have, you know, they're looking at doctor's charts for tens of thousands of people and looking at what changed in, you know, as a result. And then they're having to weed out all the things, okay, you know, lifestyle things and so on to try to determine well what is can really be a, a correlated also you don't have 10 years of people who have been on this generation of birth control correct uh i really can't speak to that um at any rate there are a number of people doing research on um hormonal birth control pills yeah. and and women's mm -hmm. voices um and I would say, you know, if you're really, really interested, it's actually a pretty hot topic um, in the voice research world. Um, you know, one of the best things you can do if you're interested in something like, go to, you know, articles by Avi Ball or Philippe La and look at the references in that, because that will then lead you to other things that they consulted. You know, that's a great way to kind of find more sources on things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are other non-hormonal options out there, right. you know, um, simple thermal method and things like that, that actually my wife and I teach classes in that. And um, so there are other options out there for people that are as just as effective if you follow that method absolutely right. the way you're supposed to. So anyway, and, and, and people make that choice based upon they don't want to have any hormonal effects on their voice, possibly. It yeah. could be for religious reasons, you know, you name it. But there are other options out there. Um, this funny. next thing, yeah. Well, sorry. No. Well, but what if you're not using it to prevent, like, pregnancy? What if right. you have to use hormonal? Yeah, that's, that was well, right. the right. question. There are, other, there are other things out there. There are some doctors who will put people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome on um, Yasmin, you know. Um, however, um, the best medication for that is um, it's what's used for a type two diabetes. Um, huh. Yeah. Let me find. See if I can find it. Um, well, because most people who get it isn't. I'll look it up. Yeah, isn't that correlated? Uh, metformin? 
Metformin, thank you. Yeah, metformin. is the medication because one of the side effects, well, the, the primary things that go on with people who have the polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is like nine to 10 percent of all women in the United States, um, your testosterone levels go out of whack, you get body hair and so on that's doing crazy. Um, it often affects blood sugar and so on. And through diet and, and using metformin, oftentimes that tends to settle it down. I mean, I had a student some years ago who um, was diagnosed with PCOS, and her doctor, um, back where she was from, she was from another state, um, had put her on yaz, you know, and it's like, okay, well, we're gonna stabilize you and so on this way, and she went to another doctor here in San Antonio and says, absolutely not. That's not, that's not dealing with a real problem. problem you know, and got her on the format, and it was like night and day for her. Mm -hmm. So getting on the right medications, because yeah, those, um, those medications are sometimes used for other things. A lot of medications are used for other kind of things, just like, you know, the medication I take to help me sleep is an antidepressant, or at least that's what it was originally formulated for, and yet it helps people get to sleep. I'm also on Lexapro, which is an antidepressant, and anxiety medication, it helps me sleep. You know, I take that and the trazodone an hour before I go to bed, sleep like a baby, it's great. You know, it's like, why have I waited so long, you know? Um, so medications are used for a variety of things other than their primary thing, but that is up to doctors to make those decisions based upon clinical research. And so um, don't self-medicate. <laughs> Did you have a question a little while ago? Yeah. Did we cover it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so use this, you know, just for information about your voice. And absolutely, anytime a doctor recommends something for me, I talk with them about all the side effects and, you know, look at all the contraindications and so on. Um, in fact, I'm starting to take the Lexapro. I said, I, I had researched it some, and he said, well, how would you like to go on this? I said, why don't you write me the prescription and I'm gonna talk to the therapist guy I'm seeing and, and you know, to kind of help me with um, strategies for sleeping better and so on. Talk to him and so on and finally, like a week went by and I was like, okay, now I've done all my research, I've talked to two different doctors, you know, then I went to the pharmacy and said, okay, I'll start taking this, you know, and I'm very glad I did, but I'm very cautious about and I think you guys, you know, obviously consult physicians. I'm not a physician. Your voice teachers are not physicians. Um, but we do have a vested interest in this. And um, ask those questions of your doctors um, so that you make sure that you're taking the medications that you need and not anything else. And that, that they really weigh the side effects because you know, a lot of blood pressure medications are diuretics, and that's gonna be very drying. Now, lowering your blood pressure is life-saving, you know, that's really important. So if you're on a medication like that, you hydrate more. You know, you do some things with your diet and, and how you, I'm on blood pressure medication, you know, I work out all the time and it's genetic in my family. So um, this next handout is on hearing. And there is a chapter in the McCoy book, which hopefully you looked at, which is about hearing health. And this is um, a presentation Dr. Jennifer Schreiner um, used to be on the staff there at um, the Health Sciences Center. She's no longer yeah. there. But um, this is some stuff about your hearing anatomy and the hair cells and the hearing loss and what's going on. It's just a PowerPoint slide, so it'd be a real quick uh, thing to look through. There are some really exciting things going on with medications. Um, you have to realize another side effect with some people of taking uh, like erythromycin is you can lose your hearing. I mean, 
certain people are genetically susceptible to having um, their hearing compromised by taking erythromycin. Mm -hmm. One of my very good friend's daughter is one of those people. She took erythromycin for an infection, and she has almost complete hearing loss on one of her ears and partial on the other. Wow. And it's and it's because she has that genetic predisposition, and she took the medication. I mean, it was like, and so it's irreversible. It is irreversible. So those are things that are known as ototoxic because they can literally wipe out or, or compromise your hearing severely. Didn't, um, did it affect the hair cells or like the I cells? don't know the exact mechanism of okay. it, honestly. Because um, if it affected the hair, the hair cells, then like there's nothing you can do. But if it was right. a cold, she could have a hearing aid. Right, right. She, she does wear hearing aids that do help. Um, so it may be a transmission thing rather than a reception. Thing. Yeah. yeah. If it damages the hair cells, though, there's very little nowadays that can be done. Yeah. What about like the cochlear implant? Cochlear implants. Um, like like yeah, the hearing that you get from that is is not nearly what we get. I mean, you get particular little bands, yeah. um, and the quality the and sensitivity that yeah. we have is just not the same. Is that the one that bypasses the tendons, the hair cells? Um, yeah, I've heard it, that it's, those don't work as well unless you learn them, like. If right. you're before seven and you get one, it works. But if it's past that, it's like impossible. Again, I'm not an expert. Um, that's something, you know, uh, Dr. Otto, who is Dr. Simpson's colleague in the Health Sciences Center, is a otologist. I mean, that's what he does. He's an ear guy. He's mm -hmm. also, believe it or not, a salivary gland guy. And I had a salivary gland uh, got blocked. And uh, he looked at it and he showed me some cool stuff. It was really, yeah. If you ever have a salivary gland block, that is not fun. Because it's like, oh my gosh, suddenly I have two little ping pong balls under, like, here. How did that happen? Um, probably because I would take um, antacid lying in the bed at night and the uh, extra minerals and stuff in that kind of got in there and blocked the. The, the duct, and so then the stuff, your saliva builds up inside because you keep making it, you know? Yeah, it was not comfortable at all. Oh. Yeah. How'd you fix it? Um, he, um, so there's some massage stuff that you can do. Um, you actually kind of go right along your jawline and you can massage the, the glands and keep the, keep the, uh, the little ducts open. Mine wasn't completely plugged. I mean, they sometimes will have to go in with a needle and basically open it up, which I don't want to do. Yeah. Okay, so with all that lovely stuff done, um, so um, we're gonna do some stuff with case histories here of someone, a student of yours coming to you and reporting some things, but First, I think it's important for us to know we are not physicians. Only medical doctors can diagnose a medical condition. What you can do, though, is you can gather information from your student to find out, is this serious? Do, they, do, they, do I need to call my doctor friend in town and you know, let them know I have a student who has a voice complaint? Um, is this something that is benign, you know, and can be dealt with with rest? So knowing the questions to ask, you know, um, and knowing when to say, okay, this is not just like a normal cold infection or fatigue or whatever. We need to get you seen. Um, so gathering information that you can pass along to a physician about your student or helping your student to kind of think through things and go, oh, wow, you know, yeah, I do need to go see a doctor about this. So let's brainstorm some questions that you might ask that would get people thinking. Can I raise this? Yes. Okay. Um, let's brainstorm some questions that you might, you know, a student comes in 
X, Y, Z is going on with my voice. I don't understand what's going on. What are things you're going to ask? How much sleep do you get? Okay, asking about sleep. Okay. That's because that's a chronic yeah. condition. Yeah. How long has it persisted? How long okay. has this been? Yeah. <laughs> How long? I remember when that song came out. That's very scary. How long has this been going on? That's a very important question to ask. Okay? Because whether this is an acute thing or when, whether this is something that's kind of been building up. Or, I would say, when do they notice it? When do they notice it? Is it, it constant or is it when they're doing something in particular? Or? So basic hygiene questions, right? Water, diet, etc. Okay. What does it feel like? What's it feel like? Okay, in Austin. Where do you feel it? Okay, sensations. Sensations. <laughs> what? Where? And we already kind of had a when. But that's okay. Okay. Somebody else? Like, uh, if they've done anything to help it, what's uh -huh. not What have anything? you done so far? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do they think might have caused it? Like, if they did something over the weekend? Right. Went to an amusement park or something. So that's kind of that gathering a history kind of thing. Yeah. Because very often you can pretty well narrow some things down um, by asking just a couple of really good questions. So describe what you're feeling as specifically as possible. We've certainly got that. Um, when, going back to Stacy, when do you feel this? And so, you know, you, you're going to ask, do you feel it when you're singing? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, can you be more specific? Is it a particular range? Or is it on these vowels but not these vowels? Is it when you sing soft or when you sing loud? Um, is it when you onset? You know, do you notice it then? Do you notice it when you're speaking? Do you notice it when you're swallowing? You know, the scratchy throat, you know, it hurts when I swallow is most of the time that's infection kind of related. And most people would go, yeah, yeah, I started to kind of get some drainage. Okay. Um, do you feel it when you're not doing anything at all? You know, is there background discomfort? Um, and all of this stuff, you know, you're gathering this information. You know, when one of you guys comes to me or, you know, or one of my colleagues say, you know, can I send them over to you and just, I mean, have you talk to them a little bit? And then I'm noting that stuff, and then if I'm writing Dr. Simpson, I'm saying, okay, here's what, you know, here's what I can give you so far, you know, on this person, and we really think you need to, you know, we need to get them over to see you, you know? So it's important that you take that information down and you are not diagnosing, you're just gathering information, okay? that will help the, the student and, and the medical professional get them the help they need. Um, we've talked about what and where and when. Uh, we haven't talked about how bad is it, you know? Oh. How bad, right? So the severity of it, yeah. Right, right, yeah, you know, and those are kind of things, you know, I look in my mouth and I see these spots, you know, and that's like, okay, oh, there's some kind of infection in there for sure. Usually spots on the walls of your, that's bacterial, you know, that's going to generally be a bacterial kind of thing. But, again, that's not for you to make the judgment, just a, more information to pass on to, you know, a doctor. 
duration of symptoms. How long has this been going on, right? We talked about that one. Frequency, is it all the time? Is it just occasionally? You know, so you're really trying to kind of narrow down well, what's going on. You may need to help them, you know? You may need to kind of ask other things like, okay, is this only in your low range? Uh, is it in their transition zones of your voice? Is it in your high range? Um, is it when you first get up in the morning or is it all the time? Um, can you sing softly okay? That's a really important question to ask. Um, how about louder? Um, any pain that you can localize, you know? Um, another really important question to ask, and you can even, um, if, they're, if they're able, you know, breaks in phonation when they do a glide, and I'll, I'll tell you about those things. Um, any change in access to their full range, you know, pitches that aren't working anymore or their dynamic range that they're not able to do. Change in the timbre and the quality of their voice, particularly if it's sudden. If they suddenly noticed a change, that's a big red flag. That's when you start having them write you notes, <laughs> you know. Um, change in their endurance. Um, this gets back to the time of day that does the time of day have anything to do with it? Um, reflux, oftentimes we reflux when we're asleep at night and we, you know, difficulty getting going in the morning and as the day goes on and you've been upright and so on, it tends to get better, you know, that's an, often a symptom of reflux. Um, um, you're trying to kind of, at this, level that is appropriate for us is, is this a cold or flu or allergies or something like that versus, is this really something that they need to see a laryngologist about? You know, and again, you're just trying to help guide that person to, to okay, you know, this isn't me, this isn't normal. Um, and to be able to talk intelligently with a doctor about, okay, I have this student and, you know, this isn't normal for them and here's the things, you know, they told me about and here's what I heard and, you know, I'd like for them to come in. Um, there are some tests that you can do for swelling of that lamina propria, the outer layer of the vocal folds. Um, these are particularly good for when you're showing that the person is really fatigued and they need some vocal rest. Um, the first is doing a real soft pitch glide on like an O or an E vowel. So like, and guys, it's you can go up into falsetto, so. is there breaks and gaps and crackles and stuff in the sound. Um, the second thing is doing staccato really light and, and fairly high on E. So again, for guys, you just do falsetto. Okay, and the third thing is singing a little bit of text. Happy birthday to you. Want them doing it really soft. Um, happy birthday is really good because there's a lot of um, unvoiced happy. You've got an H onset and then you've got a P, you know, birthday. There's a lot of voicing and unvoicing. Um, and when there's a delay in the onset to the sound, that's a sign that that outer cover of the vocal fold is, is not happy right now. You know, it could just be some swelling from, from overuse. It could be something more than that. But those are some things I, I use those periodically when somebody comes in and they say, mm, um, should we sing today? You know, I'll do a little bit of that. And if I'm hearing there's breaks and stuff, it's like, you know what? We need to rest today, okay? Um, when to tell somebody, do not talk or sing. If it hurts to make a sound, okay, and that can be from a bad cold, that can be from strep throat, you know. If it hurts to phonate, it could also mean you have a granuloma, you know. I mean, so that's why you don't want to run any risk, okay. Um, if it hurts to phonate, 
then you don't need to phonate. That pain's a real good red flag saying stop. Okay? Um, because we don't have a lot of pain receptors in the local fold itself. We don't, you know. Um, we do in some of the surrounding tissue and all, but you know, the vocal fold itself, you you don't have a whole lot of pain reception there. You do have um, a branch of the superior laryngeal nerve that is there, you know, like the tickle feeling and you're about to cough and something like that. That is, but that's about it is to my knowledge. But big red flag is somebody who says, I was um, singing and, you know, suddenly my voice changed in quality or I felt, it felt weak and I couldn't make as much sound. You know, a sudden change in quality, like you go for a note, it, it doesn't go well, and then you notice your voice is like really drastically different all of a sudden. That can be a warning sign that you've had a hemorrhage, okay? So uh, my wife had a small hemorrhage. She was singing at church. I think I got told you guys this. Mm -hmm. She coughed, and it was like, whoa, that's not right. And immediately shut it down, got somebody else to come up and sing. That's the right thing to do. It's like something happened suddenly. You're at a ball game, and you're woo-woo for the team, and suddenly your voice feels drastically different. Um, we had a student here um, some years ago who, it was right around Halloween, and um, she was teaching at her house. She had a piano at home, and she was teaching privately. And one of her students, um, she was teaching one student, I think is how this happened, and another student, you know, had just come in for the next lesson and wanted to pull a little trick on her and surprise her. And um, our grad student um, screamed, you know, because it was like, what the heck is in my house, you know? <laughs> and screamed, and she suddenly went, whoa, something's up with my voice. Something's up with my voice. And I mean, I went with her to the appointment, and she had had, um, she had some varices on the surface of the vocal cord, and there was a very small hemorrhage that she had had. Um, you know, and with breast and so on, it resolved, no big deal. But all the same, she did the exact right thing to do, which is shut up. So, you know, pain when, it, when you go to make a sound, stop. That's when you get a little foot pad and you're writing notes. Um, or um, a sudden change in the quality, the volume, the timbre of your voice to where it's like, that doesn't sound like me, and it came on like that, shut up. Um, you remember looking at Jill Green's vocal folds? Yeah. Okay, how nasty that was when she had that hemorrhage? Yeah. So, now I have a few little scenarios. So let's have gets one, and you're going to do both of them, hopefully quickly. So you have, these are two different students. Talk amongst yourselves what you're going to do. them from making something worse and if need be sending them to someone who is much more expert in things than you are and who is legally able to diagnose and treat.
lack of clarity if he's not kind of going full throttle. And this is not something that had been there before. It's difficult for him to do staccati. His high notes aren't as reliable. He's cracking sometimes where he used to not, and he says it's kind of takes more effort. Um, and he says it's come on gradually. You haven't seen him in a couple of weeks, and it's kind of come on gradually. So what about this guy? He should see a doctor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. This is somebody you would say, you know, let's get this checked out. So that what if he's like younger and he's in one of those like Ah, ah, now that is a good point. Mm -hmm. If you're going through puberty, he wouldn't be a base. <laughs> well, he might be. Yeah, you know, if you've gone know. through puberty, okay. um, that is, you know, we have to remember if you're dealing with young people in, you know, their early teens going through uh, puberty and stuff, that a husky, breathy voice that is inconsistent is normal. That's the way they are. We're going to be talking about that in a couple of days. And so making the call of is this not, you know, is this just the fact of their age and what's going on? That's a trickier thing. Always err on the side of caution. If this is like persistent or something really new all of a sudden that doesn't kind of fit the bill of the normal somebody going through puberty. Yeah. Absolutely, don't run the risk. You know, you want to be on the cautious, safe side. Better to have a, a laryngologist look at the person and say, you know, it's just puberty. It's okay. There's nothing wrong. I'm seeing here. Better that. You know, better poor and healthy than making a mistake that would be much more extensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this guy should should see a laryngologist and. Between now and seeing the laryngologist, what are you going to tell this person to do? Well, you know, limit his voice use. You know, the only things where you really need to say, shut up, is the hemorrhage. You know, um, limit his voice use. Um, I wouldn't say anything about singing, you know. Um, sleep, hydrate, obviously you can't go wrong with sleep and hydration, you know. Um, one of the big red flags, though, that kind of made you go, whoa, about this guy? Two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Two weeks. Okay, right. This isn't, this has kind of gotten worse over a couple of weeks. Okay, it didn't happen and then clear up. Okay, what else? There's more effort to do things. More effort to do things he normally used to be able to do. That's another big red flag. What else? It's breathy no matter what. The fact that he can get a clear sound when he pushes, basically, but it's breathy otherwise, that's a warning sign that there's something going on on that margin of his vocal folds where they normally were making good contact and now they're not. You know, because we can press and he still gets a clear sound. It could just be some pretty big swelling there, localized swelling, but better to have a laryngologist make that call versus, hmm, we have something going on here. That's something you should be saying, you know, this breathiness and it's getting worse, and you can push and make it sound clear, but otherwise it's breathy and your voice is cracking where it used to not, and it takes more effort. Singer. Well, you just say, okay, because I've had this very situation happened with somebody. Um, I said, okay, you know, I'm, I just want to be sure that there's not something more serious going on here, and I think it would be really important for you to be seen um, by somebody who could look at your vocal folds and, you know, rule everything out, you know, um, because this is not something that I, as a voice teacher, really need to make the call on. I would rather be safe and say, let's get you seen by a, a professional. Um, to do any other wise is not good practice on your part. So yeah, there's a lot of red flags. The fact that he can push and make it clear, but otherwise it's not. That it takes more effort, which is probably, again, he's pushing to make it sound normal. That he's cracking when he goes to sing high, that's a big warning sign, because if there's something going on on the edge of the vocal fold, 
then when you go to sing high and there's more tension on the vocal fold, if it's not stretching with its normal qualities, then yeah, it's it might be cracking. You know, he might have where it breaks out of that normal mode of phonation and suddenly his voice is doing all sorts of weird things. Now, your voice can crack when you're fatigued, you know? So trying to parse out what's fatigue and what's not, again, that's the questions, goes back to your questions, okay? History. Yeah, where you're just finding out how long has this been going on, you know? Asking the right questions to go, okay, is this something benign that just some rest and recovery is going to probably be okay and we can check back and if it's not, then we absolutely get somebody looked at. Um, rest is never a bad thing to tell someone, you know, for a few days and let's just come back in and I don't want you singing and the only, you know, if, or I don't want you singing much and you show them exactly what to do. Um, okay, do you guys have choir? Okay, so Wednesday, uh, well Tuesday, I have Daniela at 11 and Aurora at 11.30 and Catherine at 3 yeah. for your labs. And then whenever you've got observations, your last two, and your homework, your last homework, two. And then I'll get everything graded, and I'll get everything in Blackboard updated, and you'll know where you are going into the final. Yay! Sure. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know why I